Welcome to the fourth AGU-sponsored Carl Sagan webinar discussion series. My name is Dennis Ojima. I'm a senior research scientist at Colorado State University. This discussion series has been organized to delve into greater detail in the career of the AGU Sagan lecturer, who is Compton James Tucker III, um, and he'll be giving his lecture in December during the AGU fall meeting. We have conducted webinars on topics related to the Sagan legacy, the emergence of remote sensing capabilities, and the integration of remote sensing to carbon science in Earth um, system research. Today, we will hear from Matthew Hansen from the Department of Geographical Sciences at the University of Maryland on the topic of detecting um, land cover change reflections of human influence um, on the land surface. Um, before I do this, um, uh, let me provide just a brief uh, bio biographical sketch. Um, Professor Hansen is a remote sensing scientist, a specialist in land cover, land use change mapping. His research is focused on developing the improvement um, of remote sensing inputs and thematic outputs, which enable mapping of land cover across regions at global scales. He's been involved with um, the FAO um, forest cover data sets, um, has been instrumental um, in looking at um, additional detections of um, land and especially forest cover changes um, in, uh, internationally uh, throughout his career. Um, with that, let me um, have Matt proceed with his presentation. Um, and then after he's done, um, we hope to get Jim Tucker um, and Matt and myself back on the screen to uh, have a conversation. Take it over, Matt. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you very much. Thanks everybody attending. Um, yeah, my title's close enough. I do, I do start, I wanna tie it with Jim's work and how, uh, Land cover and land use change at large areas, mainly global scale, has evolved over time and where we are right now. Um, so to that end, uh, let me just do a little brief history. When when Jim and Steve did their talk at the the first of these series, they, they he he showed his uh, his cover uh, article for Science 1985, which was a land cover map using time series of monthly composited NDVI data. So just uh, maximum monthly greenness composites using from the ABHR sensor. And this idea was we had these meteorological satellites that are polar orbiting. And, and if uh, we could filter out, if they could filter out the atmosphere and actually look at the part of, part of the time series that was uh, high fidelity ref reflectance from the land surface or brightness temperature for the thermal bands, they could they could uh, create uh, uh, clean observations of the land surface. And this was a seminal work in large area land cover mapping where they took the time series monthly composites, did a principal component analysis, and in those components there were two that the first one was basically indicative of mean greenness, and the second one was indicative of seasonality. And from really those two features, you could map the zone of the humid uh, tropical rainforest zone uh, through the seasonal woodlands and the shrublands into the desert. And so the you know the humid tropics and the desert were stable in NDVI, but respectively high and low. And then everything in between was uh, highly seasonal due to the rain-driven um, vegetation response in 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 Africa. So this was super cool and uh, showed the potential of taking satellite data to monitor the land service in a consistent fashion and, and our goal and my goal and i've worked with jim and john townsend who are the lead authors on this paper uh was to create uh kind of globally consistent products so that you could put them into general circulation models and other big you know um biogeochemical type type models and parameterize them in a, in a consistent way and as I'll show you, and as we move forward, we get better and better data. Now we start looking at land cover, land use change, and then we start being more relevant to biodiversity monitoring and habitat loss. But again, the key feature being we have something that's globally consistent. As we get finer detail, it becomes more and more locally relevant. So you have the win-win of synoptic consistency, but also cut out a patch of ground and you have something that's locally 
uh, usable. The first global land cover map, this is from Ruth DeFries, John Townsend and others in 1994, was at a one degree spatial resolution. Again, AVHR, NDVI inputs, and uh, it is 360 pixels by 180 pixels. You can almost color it by, by, by number, by hand. And, uh, but this was the first one in the peer-reviewed literature, in International Journal of Remote Sensing, 1994. And I'll just go through a sequence from that point on, trying to push the envelope with NASA producing a lot of the, a lot of the input data sets from AVHR. First, uh, this data set, but, and Jim working with the, the Jim's data set uh, as, as well. But the next product by Ruth's team is at eight kilometers. And I'll zoom into one of her pixels in this one degree map. This is in Arkansas. This is a, uh mixed forest pixel and uh drum you know need a little crash there on the drums that's a joke but this is a uh, 100 roughly 100 kilometers by 100 kilometers at one degree spatial resolution uh this is the, the the characterization from roots map and then we work down to eight kilometers and we start getting you know different leaf type leaf morphology in this in this area of forest in arkansas in the Wachita range um there was one one kilometer local area coverage data set for 1992 that was global coverage and tom loveland at the usgs had put together a project to do an igbp discover sponsored land cover map of the globe at one kilometer now you can see some cities coming out in the in the uh in the landscape um we worked similarly at the university of maryland one kilometer the europeans were then had the spot vegetation product uh instrument and they could work at 100 one kilometer as well and then we moved down with MODIS. MODIS was a sensor that had land, purpose-built land, land bands. So we had near infrared and red at 250 meters and the other bands at 500 meters, seven altogether. And uh, this is from, I think, the Boston University official MODIS land product led by Mark Friedel. So we're going from one degree down to 250 meters through these polar orbiting daily acquisition sensors. And uh, they're still pretty coarse. 250 meters, we do see a, good, a lot more of the human footprint effect and monitor crops reasonably well, at least condition, if not uh, you know, crop type or area estimates very well. Um, but the other thing that's very interesting is, you know, Landsat is there. Landsat is always is the longest tenured uh, series of satellites for Earth observation from the early 70s, but it didn't have a global acquisition strategy. You had to buy the data and we didn't have to compute. So there were a lot of limitations to producing, but in 2008, they opened the, the, the archive for free um, we have compute through things like Google Earth Engine, and we could produce this depiction of this one degree square from a global perspective. So this is a subset of a 30 meter global product. And here you can see a lot more of the landscape features. You can infer a little bit more about the land use. There's forestry being taken place on the uplands. The bottom land hardwood forests are dense and fairly stable. And then the settlements are these little this, you know, ag disaggregated blobs. And then we can track at this at this more appropriate scale for monitoring change. We can track how much disturbance occurs over a roughly a decade of uh, of uh, time. And there you go. This is the turnover where the land use down here is forestry, and this place is turning over every 20, 25 years. Uh, where you know it's the tree belt as opposed to the corn belt. From all the way from Virginia over to East Texas, trees are the dominant crop on the land surface. Okay, so I just want to. Uh, uh, so that starts with Jim's work with AVHR, and uh, and it evolves. This, the methods aren't so different. Um, we 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 got into bigger data applications. We got into better algorithms of machine learning, and uh, I'll show in a deep learning example a little bit later. Uh, but with Landsat, I just want to give a little background and refer to another work by Jim, where uh, one of the big issues is to track um, for in the support of climate change mitigation strategies track emissions from land use and the dominant emission globally is deforestation of tropical forests, high carbon, high biodiverse tropical forests. And I'm going to show you the way this works uh, in, in uh, with our perspective of Landsat and the idea that um, NASA had funded a big project in the 90s to call the Pathfinder Project to look at change across the tropics from the big, you know, neotropical uh, Amazon basin, Congo basin, Africa, and this insular Southeast Asia. And what's interesting, Brazil is really good at monitoring the rainforest. I'll zoom into what we call the arc of deforestation, and I'll show a entire, I think, 20-year sequence of images for the dry season. So what's interesting about Brazil is every uh, August, uh, July, July and August, there's an atmospheric window because they're at the rainforest uh, arc of deforestation is around 13 degrees south, 
and they have beautiful imagery every year. And they can take a single image, analyze it, and update their deforestation map. And it makes it very straightforward to kind of do this work in the in where they, all the actions take a place, where they're clearing for pasture and then later soybean land uses. And this is what an RGB looks like of the time time one, 2000, time two, two 2020 images in red is all the loss. And this is our global map of loss and we can pick this up. The point being that, uh, you know, some places are pretty straightforward, but other tropical areas, even in the South America, closer to the equator, um, you have some challenges. But Jim and Dave Skoll did a paper on the uh, areas of deforestation along the front and looking at fragmentation and implications for that for habitat. But other regions weren't easily mapped. And uh, again, I'm talking right now, the time before the Landsat data, data are open and freely available, which happened in 2008. So this paper is in the in the uh, 90s, early 90s, and this is where you have to buy the data. So good that that uh, Amazon is has this wonderful single date uh, capability for updating maps. So I'm going to show you the entire Landsat acquisition set of acquisitions for 2000 in a more challenging region, which is Central Africa, especially near the Gulf of Guinea and Gabon. And here's what the data look like over the entire 2000 period. And you're like, oh, that method doesn't work. But if we take the perspective or the methods that we use with AVHR and MODIS to stack up pixels, not images, we can throw away the clouds, throw away the shadows and come up with best, best pixel composites. And this is what this place looks like if you can do per pixel processing on high quality and do normalization and all that. So. This is the way we do this work in 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 other it, generically globally now. So we take I guess the point I'm just trying to make is the lessons learned from AVHR and MODIS we apply to Landsat. We do time series filtering, we do QA, and we can normalize the data, take out BRDF effects. This is before the these are old slides before the Landsat archive is open. We have like 300 images here we're practicing with, and now we can look make the Amazon the Congo Basin look consistent and make maps of forest extent and change. So that's fun. And uh, part of Jim's work with NASA uh, was to uh, be supportive of a USAID project in Central Africa, where we were monitoring the last intact landscapes of the Congo Basin. You can see on the left what the reference map was for the minist forestry ministry in Zaire, and uh, what we were able to do uh, in collaboration with uh, partners in Congo. We still work in Congo. We have a meeting tomorrow with the forestry ministry and others. On our on our progress today, but we all of a sudden go from a very crude uh, course map to mapping not just tree cover but forest type, um, forest landscapes of certain extent, adding wetland forest versus terra firma forest, mapping all the disturbances, mapping the settlements because the proximate pressure to these forests are smallholder agriculturalists, mapping the agricultural footprint of shifting cultivation, and now we're cooking right. So again getting into big data, processing every pixel, doing time series and adding themes, and you can build out a pretty nice uh, uh, land cover land use change uh, quantification that can support decision makers in, 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 in understanding what's happening in a particular environment. Okay, so that also was Jim through uh, NASA and uh, USAID and a fantastic project that helped us get used to processing Landsat data like we process MODIS and ABHRR. And now we just process globally at Landsat. So I'll, I'll get into that in a second. So we have the, the medium spatial resolution archives that are open and available, uh, late, added to Landsat, you all know, Sentinel-2, AB, incoming CD from the European Space Agency, um, free and available. We have big data computing capabilities. Um, In-house in our lab, we have 23 petabytes in, uh, of data. We have the entire Landsat archive on disk, ready to go. Other folks avail themselves of Google Earth Engine, which is a fantastic resource for democratizing um, access to big data. Of course, we have advanced algorithms, and they're changing all the time with deep learning being the latest, uh, coolest example. And then we can support our validation with commercial data. So uh, I, I don't think I'll get into that, maybe. Um, but we, we have new commercial data sources, such as Planet, that help us to do uh, even better work. So we know how much data we have. We can process all of it. And this is the, the data richness of the Landsat archive. You can see how it changes over time. It makes it very hard to make turnkey algorithms. As you go back in time, the data get of uh, lesser quality and lesser richness, and it gets harder to do the mapping. But as we go now, we are at 250,000 images usable 
per year globally, and we can make really nice, uh, clean time series data sets with which we can turn into depictions of land cover and land use. Here is an example of tree cover loss and gain for a 12-year period. This is from a paper we published in 2013. And then the raw dynamic of uh, the trends and what you're seeing here is where you see uh, reds, it's warmer, that means more change more recently, and yellows uh, change more in the past. And there in, in Brazil, you can see the arc of deforestation is very yellow. And that indicates that the higher rates of change occurred closer to 2000. And Brazil is the only country to interdict deforestation rates and dramatically reduce them. And of course, in the news last couple of years, it's been more than a couple of years, it's been the better part of a decade, they've been ticking up. And so they, we can expect this color ramp to turn a little warmer as we get closer uh, to the edge of the rainforest in, in, in current years. We process the entire Landsat archive in house. Peter Potapov is a, uh, is uh, my co-director at our lab, which is called GLAD, and um, this idea, and we're not the only ones, but this idea that everybody's moving towards the AVHR MODIS land science team models of producing intermediate clean data, gridded composited time series, whether it's 16 day or monthly or annual, that can be used off the shelf. Uh, this is the idea, and we have uh, produced, uh, I think since 1998, Peter's set up all of, uh, of 16 day Landsat tiles, for access and uh, mapping, just to make the data use, usable, a la the MODIS land science team. Okay, so given this uh, big processing capability, the, the ability uh, to uh, take data off the shelf and run algorithms on it, um, we have, a, and, and tools like Google Earth, we see the democratization of bit large area mapping and monitoring, which is great, because the more eyes there are on a problem, the quicker we'll solve that problem, and the more creative we'll be in solving that problem. Um, the benefits are obvious to me, but there are also downsides because uh, in addition to, you know, um, more maps, uh, we could have a lot of poor maps. And I think we also see that in the peer-reviewed literature, that it can be almost too easy to make a map. And there is a there is an expertise to map making that I think uh, is eludes people. And I could I could give examples, but um, it is a it is a uh, it's not just a programming problem. It's a domain expertise challenge as well in terms of geography and environmental knowledge about the drivers of change the distributions of different features across the planet and when you're making a map you have some a priori knowledge of what's what it's supposed to look like and there's an iterative dynamic and active learning aspect to making maps that uh it, people will will come to realize and, and embrace what it means is that if we have a bunch of maps mapping the same thing, they could be orthogonal. And this is the danger. I mean, John Townsend published a paper in the early 90s showing how our, our global understanding of forest extent was highly inconsistent. And it's it, because different people use different def, different uh, definitions. They use different um, uh, methods for measuring forest area. And there was no coherent understanding of how much forest there, there was. With the satellite, we think we assume because we have this standardized signal that we can create consistent products, and and we can. But if we don't approach it in the same way in terms of calibration and and uh, and understanding uh, the definitions and how they uh, are manifest in the data, we can get remote sensing products that don't agree either, and that's that's unfortunately quite common. Puts a greater emphasis on accuracy assessment. So we spend half our time actually assessing the accuracy of our maps. The making of the map is just a point of departure to doing sample-based estimates that tell you your areas and your accuracies. Okay, so this is a hierarchy of how we approach uh, global land monitoring uh, or, or any large area. We think about uh, dividing it uh, hierarchically. Up in the top of the hierarchy are, are cover, the, the kind of uh, physical vegetation traits that, that are manifest more clearly in the satellite data, so percent vegetation versus percent ground, bare ground or non-vegetation. When you get the vegetation, where are the trees versus non-trees, so tall or short vegetation, and so on. And at some point in this hierarchy, we turn to these blue boxes where we separate what separate out what is natural from what is land use. Much harder. And this is really where I think a lot of the deep learning can come into play. I'll give an example for settlements, where if if the land use is characterized by a particular spatial pattern, deep learning has some advantages over per pixel mapping. But in general, it's harder to do use compared to cover, because cover is just the biophysical properties of the surface. Use has this other aspect to it in terms of um, uh, economic uh, application. All right, so 
I said that, uh, you know, we, we have great algorithms, we have great data inputs, um, we have this iterative method to developing training data in our approaches, we, all of our stuff is supervised, and this dashed line shows this iterative step where you assess the map quality uh, and iterate before you spit out a final map and do the assessment of validation with reference data. This is our kind of design cycle. And the most important thing with the with the map output is to throw samples that are stratified based on the map, and from those samples you can get area estimates. This is a hard thing to to communicate sometimes, but the map is not the answer. The the pixels as they are summed up, if you map let's say deforestation or forest loss, you don't just sum up the pixels and report that area. You'd throw samples and look at reference data, and the reference data can be a lot of different sources. It could be high res, it could be time series, but it's it's basically sample units that are assessed to be right or wrong or assessed to be deforestation or not deforestation, soybean or not soybean, whatever the, the, the topic is you're investigating. And from that sample, you get your area and your uncertainty because the map itself has no such statistical properties. It's biased and it doesn't have an associated uncertainty. So this, this is a key thing. And if you're doing support for um, national reporting to international protocols, uh, like the UNF's triple C, you have to you have to do this work. You can't just make a map. Let me show you some global products. Uh, in this hierarchy, simple one being surface water dynamics. This is from uh, Amy Hudson and Amy Pickens in our in our lab. And the idea is that every pixel in the Landsat archive we flag in a QA step as being water or not water. And we can stack up those time series of flags and say whether something's stable or not stable, whether it's seasonally dynamic or interannually dynamic and this is an example from Iran uh, very similar to the RL RLC where where diversions of water into these uh, reservoirs that you can see are blue are collecting water and then there's might be a climate change signal and this lake Ermia is reducing in size um, this is an intraannual dynamic that is the, the the southern hemisphere rainy season fills up the Zambezi uh, river this is the Barazzi Plain uh, in, in the upper Zambezi, and it fills up every April, May with water, and then it, it empties out the rest of the year. The white ribbon down the middle, that is the permanent channel of the Zambezi. Everything with color is ephemeral, uh, seasonal. So what we do is we, we take that map and we stratify and we throw samples, and those samples are, are examined in detail to assess the changes that we mapped and do assign the same change categories so we look at these pixels and we say well okay um is there any water in this pixel uh, when did the water occur in this case it's a it's a reservoir being built in around uh 2013 and we assign that and from this we can get areas so from the samples we get the area of the inland land surface inland water bodies of about four percent of the water that we that we assign through this sampling exercise 40% of it is dynamic. So water is really interesting because it's a very simple thing conceptually to map and spectrally it's unique, but it's super dynamic. And as we map with Landsat versus Sentinel-2 and even try with Planet, we'll see different uh, scales of water as well. So even though it's pretty straightforward it, it, in its dy dynamism, it's very complicated in terms of uh, uh, it's, a, it's a change within the year, between years and cyclical natures therein. Give you another uh, global product in this hierarchy, and this is at the high end of that hierarchy. It's just bare ground. You could invert this and say percent vegetation, and it's very simple. It's not simple to map, but it's it's clean and intuitive, and there's a strong signal. Um, back in the, if you look at any remote sensing textbook, they'll have the soil line, which is an NDVI-based indicator of vegetated, non-vegetated land, and this is something like that. And when we look at this over time, we can we can map changes in this, and and I'll get to why that's important, but um, obviously uh, where bare ground is increasing, we can anticipate what is it? Is it land use? Is it natural dynamics? Desertification comes to mind. What is it? So we can map up, uh, put time series of this product together, and this is Dallas-Fort Worth, and around the DFW airport, you see this hive of activity with increased bare ground where commercial buildings or commercial uh, plots are being uh, laid out, airports, uh, runways are being extended, highways are being built. This is the kind of thing we see with this bare ground dynamic, although we're not labeling it as infrastructure. What do we do? 
we take the map and, and our big hotspots are China. This is um, could be a geography test here. I don't label this at all. This is Beijing, there's Shanghai. This is North Korea. It looks like um, uh, nighttime lights, but it's not. It's just bare ground game, but it's quiet in terms economically. You don't see the, the dynamism as you, as you do in South Korea and China. This is the US. We see mountaintop removal in Appalachia. We see these bright green, these greens and blues are fracking landscapes where we have the little bare ground pads of fracking uh, coming on. And then all the pinks around cities are suburban sprawl or commercial development. So we throw samples again. We throw samples and we get areas of this dynamic and we can divide those areas by key uh, or interesting uh, economic activities. For example, energy uh, resource extraction, such as um, mining. We can do commercial residential expansion. We can do con uh, infrastructure. And we can assign each reference sample per to a dy dynamic. And from this, we can make stories of the change in bare ground gain over time. And you can see in this center plot that it really does pick up the, the, the hot spot of the financial crisis, pre-financial crisis, then the tailing of that. And, Ching Ying is a student in our lab who wrote a, a paper showing this could be a leading economic indicator, uh, especially the commercial residential. It correlated very well with this time series. And then also you can see on the on the on the uh, lower right, breaking out by country these dynamics. And so you see the China and US kind of for a half of global bare ground gain, uh, China a third, and China with its infrastructure developed being seven times the US, um, you can see just a lot more, um, let's say investment in China uh, compared to the US. But the red color is very interesting because certain countries like Canada, Russia, uh, Brazil, and, and Australia are dominated by resource extraction, which is to feed China, China's development. So very interesting example where you just map one simple land cover theme, bare ground gain, but you get a very rich story about economic dynamics. Another example, uh, and it is pseudo-global, if you were doing a crop monitoring by commodity crop, you can't really throw a global algorithm in it because the phenologies are out of sync temporally and um, management complications make uh, tracking particular cultivars very hard. So when you do something like soybean in, in, in South America, you have, to, you have to separate soybean from corn, cotton, dry beans, and you have to also be a sen sensitive to the different soybean varieties that are short cycle, long cycle, um, irrigated, non-irrigated, it's a trip. But with this approach of mapping and sampling, we can do the US, Canada, we can do South America, we can do China with the same method and just move across the globe, uh, tracking this, 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 this key commodity. And it can be used for you know, winter wheat or, or corn or what have you. So we make maps of soybean, and then we stratify the, the, the land based on our relative density of soybean. And within these strata, we throw samples. So this is, again, the reference. Now we've done the map and we're ready to, to, to do the reference assessment to make the area estimate of soybean. And the thing is with soybean, we can't sit at our desk and do this job. We have to go to the field. So we go to these, these cluster samples, which are these blocks, and in each block, throw samples and visit the fields and assess the condition and track the uh, area of the crop. And from that, those blocks, we do uh, our area estimate. And it's really, we have, a, you know, this is a little bit more statistically complicated than our other approaches, but it, it works very well. And we can track uh, both, uh, you know, the, the vagarities of policy in soybean pricing um, in the U.S. with our trade conflict with China, expansion rates in Brazil in response to that that and just you know their their greater um, let's say availability to extensify the footprint of soybean and even a place like Argentina where heavy taxes on soybean have, have stopped uh, expansion so every place has its own dynamic but we're looking at each place in a similar way and doing a, a, a consensus kind of approach and we've done China as well even though I don't show it here but again this is another global assessment but it's a little more complicated because you have to march across the different uh, landscapes the different regions of the world okay just want to show an example of uh new 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 data from jedi uh you all a lot of people are downloading jedi data we've we uh ralph Dubai is the pi in our department and we've been using 
um, the Jedi shots to calibrate our Landsat time series and to map heights with Landsat. This data, these data are available now on our GLAD website. And uh, um, just the idea that we have a physical measurement of height to train our algorithm is really awesome. We've tested this with glass uh, and other people have. And just the idea that we're, you know, we're, we're, we're moving this out. And again, in a global monitoring sense, this is cover defined by height, which helps you to de define, you know, your definition of what a forest is. You're, you define it by three meters, five meters, 30% cover, 100% cover, what have you. Okay, let me, uh, let me just show you what these things look like in, in, in real form. Um, I'll, I'll start with, uh, I'll start with this height map. So. When we do 30 meter heights, um, it is a nice a nice kind of depiction. Like if you look at the Congo Basin, we see the wetland forests are shorter than the adjacent terra firma forests. The terra firma forests are logged, wetland forests are not logged. It's a lot of nice detail in this map. And I think we're gonna, as we get more Jedi data, we're gonna iterate this product, build up time series that'll be able to track certainly uh, gain and, and big, big parts of the disturbance dynamic. Um, we have uh, mapped wetlands as a land form uh, using the same approach. And this is a very important stratifier for land use potential. So we're, this is an example of a global land, land wetland map. We have cropland uh, as, a, as a theme, obviously important um, land use attribute. And then we also have another land use that we're testing with deep learning. And so this is a, a convolution neural network approach to mapping built up area. And uh, just a fun, fun uh, thing to work with, and 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 tough to you know corral deep learning uh, algorithms. In my opinion, we have we're not so comfortable with it. But you see a lot of great detail. This is Landsat where we're picking up all these road networks, and you can see it's a little it's a little flaky in terms of its continuity, but very nice. And then in the hierarchy, we can stack them all up. So here is a, a map where we have um, tree height, percent vegetation, water, ice, permanent ice as cover. And then we've added um, built up area, cropland and tree cover dynamics. So forestry and shifting cultivation as categories. Um, and then we've divided into terra firma and wetland land uses. So when you zoom into, for example, South Florida, you see the Everglades wetland hemmed in by sugarcane and built up area. And I think the wetlands are really powerful because they really do explain, again, where you can and cannot go to do land use and you can drain them if you have to. Um, places we keep our percent bare ground inside our built up area. So you can see downtown Los Angeles uh, compared to the lesser developed areas. Um, Let's see another example. Uh, placed with really incredible rates of change uh, it, on terra firma land, but also in wetlands is Indonesia. So all these bright reds and purples um, are tree cover dynamics related to palm oil and forestry land uses that are, again, uh, encroaching on peatland for, forests that are um, big emitters of carbon. And uh, anyway, so that's where that's that's kind of the the aspiration. This is just an example uh, putting together these individual maps that are hand tailored, but defined in such a way that they are harmonized as you overlay them. And so you end up getting this land cover land use dynamic or in the land cover land use uh, depiction that is consistent with the stuff we did way back when in 1994, just at a, at a 30 meter uh, spatial resolution obviously with uh, better spectral inputs built for land monitoring and thematically richer capabilities because we've just gotten better at this over time. I'm almost done. I, I wanted to show, is Jim, is Jim there? So one of the nice things about Jim, Jim, yes, Jim I am. you just published in Nature again, so uh, <laughs> pretty cool. Uh, so congratulations on that. And um, I, put, I put the, you want to talk about this? Or you want me to just riff on it? Um, I'll very quickly go through it. You can hear in the background, I'm taking care of my two grandkids in Santa Fe. So uh, we recently published the first paper in a series of papers, which address, which we hope will address questions about the semi-arid land carbon sink. Um, and so this is one of the first steps, a tree census from space, 
We go from 24 north to 12 north degrees latitude. We have a study of about 1.3 million square kilometers that appeared in Nature last week. Um, we're about to expand this all the way from the Atlantic Ocean to the Red Sea. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, this is what the area looks like. Are in, Jim, so you just got to deal with it. We have we have scattered trees. So these are areas which do not map well with Landsat or or with Sentinel data because we have scattered trees. So we're using what I'll be showing right now for a 1.3 million square kilometer study. We used 50,000 commercial satellite images from Digital Globe, and we take those and then we form them down into a mosaic. So we go from A to B to C to the mosaic on the right. Um, so again, this uh, this is one of our UTM zones. We actually use two UTM zones for our study. Um, again, from 12 north to 24 north. Let's go to the next slide. Now, if we're trying to count trees, we operate in the dry season starting on the 1st of November. This is a plot from Modus in Niger at 14 north. Um, and what we see is the NDVI profile. And when we come to November, we enter the dry season and trees in these areas retain their leaves at least for two months or so. And so we actually map trees during that time period where you have the red arrow in the top of the three panels. Let's go to the next slide. This is what our results look like. We, we use NDVI and, and the panchromatic data together uh, we have a training data set of 90,000 trees, which Martin Brandt assembled personally. That's why he's the first author on the paper. Uh, my job was to organize the satellite data, but Martin and I work very closely together. So here's an area in Senegal where now we zoom in and we see individual tree crowns. We're mapping these at the 50 centimeter level. And we do this on Blue Waters, the big NSF supercomputer, using machine learning, artificial intelligence, based on our 90,000 training data of individual trees. Next slide. So this is these are some summary figures from our paper, uh, where we have the density per hectare and canopy cover versus rainfall. And in this study, we enumerate it. 1,837,565,501 trees. And every tree is unique. And this is just an example in the upper left hand corner where our study was in the top center and right examples of, of tree crowns being mapped. And then in the bottom, we have these two relationships to rainfall from the density per hectare of trees based on different canopy, canopy crown sizes and on the right hand side in terms of canopy cover next slide I think, I think that's all i got sorry yeah sorry oh you didn't get the other two i can find them hold on hold on hold on, hold on. so what i've asked matt to do in a study like this when you enumerate something in the billions you have to have some way to view the data so let's come on down yes so then let's go to the next slot, to, to, to slide 11. So this, so in this slide, this, we're able to go in with our viewer to any individual tree crown. In the very center in the hatched area is one tree. And if you have x-ray vision, you can see that it is tree number 413,067. And it has a crown area of 189 cubic or a rather square meter area. So you need something like this to be able to look at what you have. It, are there other slides after this, Matt? Let's look and see. So this is what we're doing now. We're extending things ninefold across all of Africa from the Atlantic Ocean to the Red Sea. This is one of our first runs. We discovered we had about 20% missing data, which didn't process. So in this zone for our first pass, we enumerated 10 billion trees. Um, but we were finding this and we're just now starting to rerun the area with much better data. And I think that's the last slide in the series. Right, that's awesome. So, you know, I, just to tie it back to my, my work, when you do Landsat, you put a 30, 30 meter pixel on this landscape, you are not seeing those trees. 
and the soil background reflectance is too strong. And the trees are, well, it's a, depending on how you define it, you're defining on area, but height, there's not a lot of shadow being cast here either. So there's not a lot of the light extinction you associate with forest. So it is a super cool uh, alternative approach to get a woody biomass that we just can't do as well as that. It's also, sorry, I'd just like to add um, on the bleeding edge of the deep learning side, because you're doing these, you're treating these as objects. So your, your granularity of the high res is beyond the object. So you have to look at it contextually, which is unlike a lot of the previous work we do where the pixel is a, a mixture of different elements. Um, so that's really cool. And congratulations to um, Brant, Mr. Brant. So one of the things you see here is there's not a good correspondence between our mapping of the tree crowns and this background image. And that's because we have uh, a geolocation uncertainty between the two on the order of plus or minus four or five meters. And we have much more accurate tree crown mapping than the background image of this area. So when you start to work at finer and finer spatial scales, you have to spend more and more time on geolocation accuracy. And that's why these two images don't agree better. So um, let me just wrap it up real quickly. I, I uh, Thanks, Jim. Is that okay? You're cool? Yeah, that's fine. Um, you know, I would just state that there is this, uh, we still have a, 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 a space between the commercial sector and the, and the, and the pu public provisioning of these data. When you do really large area map, mon mapping and monitoring, um, you know, the free and open data are the, are the key to that. Um, when we get down to the finer resolution, it is commercial and it's it's more of a challenge to get the data and to apply it over time at scale. So we still we we have a prop we have a challenge there exploiting this kind of information generically. Um, but I think in general, with uh, with uh, you know the experience we have monitoring key dynamics across the globe is not straightforward, but absolutely operationalizable. Um, and I keep saying to folks that uh, when you talk about our limitations in terms of changing the trajectories of you know, habitat loss and the like, we're not technologically limited. It's not about observational capability. On a scientific perspective, sure, we'd like to know with more precision what the carbon flows are, and sure, we'd like to know, you know, the, you know the exact number of species lost, sure. But we know the trends and we know which way they're going. And it's really about governance and the implement, implementation of policy and the enforcement of policy that is the primary limiting factor, not us. Uh, we're doing pretty good work and we're always advancing, uh, bringing more definitive information to the decision support systems, but they, in my opinion, are rather weak uh, in terms of implementing um, you know, a sustainable planet. I think that's good for me. Do you have anything on that? No, this is great, Matt. And, and Jim, thanks for uh, your additional comments, especially with the advancements of it. Um, so this is the time now, or in the next 15 minutes or so, we'll have some uh, conversation. And, um, and Jim, uh, when, you're, when it's possible, just um, pop on in. But it seems, you know, it's really great to see this advancement in our ability to see the land surface and you know it's in our, in our conversations with policymakers um, as you alluded to at the end i mean having these images especially in a temporal frame really provides you know sort of how how big of an impact uh, we have had on the earth system um, through deforestation through crop um, expansion through um, extraction industries and things like that in and you have been involved in these conversations through efforts at fao and with different governments um, especially in brazil and southeast asia and in africa so as you as you move forward in these sort of policy discussions what is it that the information you know how do you communicate that and what sort of interaction do you need to educate policymakers to use this information which is so rich oh man can you hear me yes yeah i think um that that is the hardest 
thing when you when you have uh let's say and, and again I'm, I'm very quickly out of my domain here but when you're doing these international protocols and they're not they're not you know they're not binding they're voluntary um it, you end up having you know to work with like bilateral uh agreements like norway guyana norway you know it's norway a lot a lot of times it's germany and they and they work in a bilateral fashion to do results-based um payments and that's fine but um it's not really what we need uh and and so i i think a more rigorous uh framework where most you know where where we have greater participation uh greater systematic um uh contributions from countries will be key on the other on the on another challenge is really the capacity uh when we work with brazil you know we're it's peer-to-peer -peer. brazil's fantastic they they have the i think preeminent monitoring capability of the land surface uh of any country uh, in terms of land cover and deforestation um other countries you know don't even have permanent staff in that sector so you have some really real challenges in terms of countries owning the process, even if they're willing to do it in terms of resources to support civil servants who have a mandate to do this. And then overriding all of that is are the are the profit profit uh, motives of you know how valuable palm oil is and and uh, cattle and the like, um, and how inexorable uh, our our appetite is for 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 uh, you know increased uh, rich diets and the like so that's that's a challenge and the other thing i find really really hard is like i grew up in indiana and indiana uh was 90 percent hardwood forest back in the day we have indiana's very low natural capital a couple of national forests in the south southern part of the state but we've profited from converting all of our our forests to to high intensity land uses and it's you're gonna have to you have to really be realistic about expectations of countries to forego that that development opportunity and I don't think we have, you know, again, that's part of this protocol uh, creation and and, and um, understanding that, well, okay, if we're not going to develop the Amazon basin, what is what is the, you know, payment to not do that? So I think it's got a lot of elements that are really challenging. It's easy for me to say uh, what I say that, you know, we failed at it. But uh, my, my real important point, I guess, is that, you know, there's enough information out there to, to track it and to, to measure performance. And then the real question is how do you turn that performance or back around uh, so that uh, you know the balance there's a there's a balance of economic development with the ecosystem service maintenance and uh, that's one we have not met with success. Yeah, so another difficult area is connecting land cover, and I'm really pleased about how the advancement of looking at different land uses and defining those, but then the underlying ecosystem processes and you know, talked about the carbon stocks but then you know looking at nitrogen use water use um, these other um, ecosystem processes and properties how do you see us moving forward as a community to blend other techniques modeling for instance into um, this remote sensing capability of of really looking at the spatial domain and you know with the advancement of the time series that you develop, you have you know a temporal um, um, time scale as well. But it seems to me that to really get at some of the uh, issues of ecosystem services, how do we actually get move forward with that? Right. I, I have two responses. It depends on what which one you're talking about. For example, um, you know certain things. I think like carbon stocks or biodiversity. I think the satellite's a great targeting mechanism. So, for example. Um, if you're going to do forest degradation, understand carbon emissions from logging in the tropics, uh, you're not going to do that at your desktop. Your, your desktop will help you show you which landscapes are experiencing that. And then you can do a stratified sample in situ. And there you can you can use some mix, maybe fly an airborne lighter or what have you, and you can track I think, the change in structure and have that modeled into to biomass. Uh, mm -hmm optical time series are not going to I would not pay carbon credits or anything based on a Landsat time series of biomass in a, in a logged environment it just doesn't work so the first thing is a lot of I think we, we could be very smart about leveraging the satellite to target our in-situ data same with biodiversity we know where the big last chunks of naturalists are naturalness are we don't know if they're hunted out or whatever but we know in in, in extent 
and stability where the big forests are that are that are are are, are persisting and where they're being lost. And if, if we use that as a way to 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 top down kind of design uh, field work, I think we we meet with a lot of success. Uh, on the other side, you know, the, some of the other ones that you mentioned, um, you know, the nitrogen cycle and stuff, emissions and that sort of thing. I'm obviously. If you're mapping, uh, you know, uh, intensity of uh, of agricultural land use practices, crop types, and the like, I mean, I think you got a big, uh, uh, quite a leg up in terms of parameterizing your model. I'm not a modeler, but um, you know, we mapped uh, for South America, um, well, at least since 2000, doubling of cropland in in Brazil. I, I'm forgetting some of my crazy numbers, but you know, the footprint of land use in South America went from like 25 to 40 percent in the last 30 years it's crazy i mean you just look at it from from an adhr perspective it just gets brighter and brighter and brighter and 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 that dynamic is an input to these modeling exercise biogeochemical modeling exercise there's going to be a big signal there and i think it'll be a, a you know useful a useful kind of parameter to include especially if it's thematically re relevant tied to the tied to the particular uh, variable of interest but i can't say much more i'm not i'm not on the modeling side well, I recall early on in our conversations with foresters that given that foresters were trained to look at carb at sort of lumber of you know sort of board feet and the stock that it was a difficult sort of education and communication that in the earth system uh, science world we're interested in the carbon fluxes mm -hmm. and going from stock to fluxes have you seen um i guess advancement in the um knowledge and you know how to communicate with foresters about understanding mm -hmm. and and be able to convert what they have in way of a rich data set but it's really not that useful in way of looking at you know what's the net emission from a forest um, even though you can map it you can map forests very well now but then actually getting net fluxes is, is really a challenge i think still well, for sure, you're right. Absolutely, I I uh, I think it's the it's the kind of um, it's the kind of challenge where you can't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. So, for example, if you're going to do emissions estimations from deforestation, um, I think we need to map some broad forest types and just uh, based on inventory data assign them a, a carbon stock. You know, this this forest has this carbon stock plus or minus based on the uh, the, uh, the statistics from the inventory and not try to get it per pixel carbon emissions. I think that is such, that's that's fraught with all kinds of challenges. So um, I, I still think uh, we can let the inventory, um, and I get, I get your point as well, that they're not mapping exactly the variable we would like, we need more, more to do so. Um, and, but, you know, in the tropics, we still have places where you know the democratic republic of congo doesn't have a national forest inventory that's what we're gonna do um so i i i think you have to just kind of phase in your your methods and go with the thing that uh, is defensible and agreeable to to the parties not the perfect thing and then you know work in the background of the, the perfect thing but um i think we still have a long way to go with your aspiration uh, for sure but i think you know it's it's amazing though the type of um you know advancements you and the community has made of really looking at this i think uh, what you indicated about the partnership between the private sector and and things like nasa i mean i, I think nasa is still hampered by um that that commercial uh public interface where they're not allowed to um, delve into sort of the high um, high spatial resolution um, data collection and so in a sense some of the science that nasa could conduct is is being pursued and i think what jim has put together in way of a that partnership has really shown us what can be done but at some point it seems like there needs to be a policy change about what level of investigation can NASA delve into. And I think, you know, they're right now, uh, just because of legislation, 
um, in policy, they're, they're not allowed to go to the hyper, the hy hyperspatial. Right. There's that 10 meter threshold that um, that's just a that's you know that's a le left over from I don't know. 1960s, I guess, but, um, 70s. <laughs> if you had if you you know the the planet data and the and the company get huge credit for having the unbiased an acquisition of global data. So they're thinking like uh, like like we we're used to thinking about the planet as a single entity, and they're collecting high spatial, high temporal, but little obviously a lot less robust radiometric data. And uh, there are a lot of problems that could be solved with those data at scale, um, for sure. And uh, it's a matter of, uh, yeah, well, how important is it to us? For sure, when you do the the Landsat has Landsat uh, USGS done, they've done uh, uh, studies on the payback from the free and open data policy, and they're many times more valuable than the, the cost of the instrument. They've done a couple of those studies. And it's like a piece of infrastructure, obviously. It's like a bridge uh, or a GPS where if you use it and you let more and more people use it, it pays for itself through the public good that the applications uh, provide. So why wouldn't that scale down? Of course it would scale down, of course. So if you put a lot of money into that kind of system, uh, but you keep it private and in, in, uh, in the hands of just a select few, we're gonna solve a lot less problems. And I guess in, in the hype, thinking about the hyper, hyper, hyperspectral space as well, have you been involved with, you know, working with Greg Asner or other groups that, of trying to bring in uh, more and, and linking in some of the hy hyperspectral data sets with the data that you have? You know, I, I'm, I mean, hyperspectral is too far on the research uh, scale for me because we, we, we need the time series. Um, and, and we need the high uh, signal to noise for these broad bands, much less really, really narrow bands. Um, so, you know, uh, the, we need to scale our stuff, you know, through time and across the globe. And hyperspectral is just, I don't think, you know, we'll, we'll see. Landsat Next is this, you know, they just announced the RFI for it and it'll be very different. I don't know how you would call that continuity. It, it has spectral bands, maybe through a constellation, you, you get there. So it could be very soon we, we, we can start looking at, at, at what you, you know, this idea of uh, narrow bands at scale, but um, we'll see, not yet. Well, that's for the next generation. So I think we need to leave yeah. some things uh, for uh, yeah. the upcoming researchers and things. And so. That's not for me, right. <laughs> so um, do you have any last, um, comments before we uh, close up the session for today not cool it's just fun to do this with Jim uh, starting with Jim's science paper and come through to his nature paper I really like that and um, and the folks like Jim and John and you know that uh, paved the way just want to acknowledge them super cool Tom Loveland Dave Skoll yeah and you worked with Ruth DeFreeze quite a bit Ruth yeah Ruth yeah for sure and so good uh, folks no, you guys at Maryland are really um, providing a great service to the community and the, the, the archive that you have and the, and the sort of uh, the portal that you've developed. And so that's been that's been super. And our conversation about, you know, sort of in your work with policy, it's sort of a good segue for um, the presentation. Let me see. Let me pull this up. Um, on November 4th, uh, November 12th. Thursday, November 12th, we'll have uh, Professor Michelle Betzel um, talking about um, global environmental policy, linking earth system changes to policy actions and how earth observations provide the right platform at the right time. And so I think, you know, this is a, um, it's it's been interesting to kind of weave different storylines that Jim's been involved with and bringing in people like yourself and and others into this conversation. It's been a very uh, uh, telling story. So thank you for uh, contributing. And I, I, I might see if if we can get you um, to join the class on maybe next Thursday as well. I'll send you an email and see if you're available for that. Great, thanks Dennis. Thanks a lot for having me. All right, thank you all. Um, and again, November 12th will be the next uh, webinar with Michelle Betzel. Thank you.